Before we turn the lights down, um, I'd just like to say that uh, this has been really a great several days here, and I'd like to thank the Montana Historical Society for putting this on. Um, it's just been incredible. I must say I was kind of shocked to find out that the Historical Society was 150 years old. Um, when I was on a work release program from Plentywood High School, I used to go down and Kirby would mentor me on Montana history, and many days he'd have me go to the chalkboard and write 100 reasons why I love Charlie Russell. <laughs> and I, I, when I first met uh, Kirby, he looked like that early picture, only had sunglasses on, and he came up in a roadrunner. <laughs> And I, and I had lots of questions. I said, Kirby, how old is the Montana Historical Society? And Kirby said, Larry, you only need to remember two things. I'm from Texas, and this place never really got started until I arrived. <laughs> so the only conclusion I can uh, make from this is that uh, Kirby's 175 years old. <laughs> and the ultimate conclusion is, is it's good to have a friend who's a dermatologist. <laughs> I don't think Kirby looks a day over 50. Um, can we put the lights up for a second? You know, um, I have life principles, and one of my life principles is gratitude should never be the shortest felt emotion. And I wanted to just point out a couple people that I really think uh, need to be recognized, but maybe we can't turn the lights up. Okay, I don't want to make this up. Well, maybe we can do it at the end. Why don't we do that? Um, I'd like to thank uh, the C.M. Russell Museum and the Gilcrease Museum, the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction, the University of Oklahoma for um, supporting this book. Byron Price actually took a call from me and uh, he agreed to do this. And of course I um, dedicated this book to Brian Dippy. Um, and uh, we all know how important he is to this whole story. You know, great biographers uh, make the readers feel like they know the person better than actually the friends that knew Charlie Russell, and Brian has achieved that. And um, I called recently Donna, um, and Donna usually answers the phone uh, behind every good woman, and, um, and I said, Donna, I really want to share with the folks the relationship between a photograph and the words that go with it, um, or writing, there's a connection there. Um, pictures tell a truth, but they, they don't tell the whole truth, photographs. And I said, is there a photograph that Brian cherishes more than any other? I said, maybe it's tea and crumpets at the Empress, um, or maybe a photograph with Byron Price, um, or, or um, another dignitary. And uh, she said, no, Larry, his, his favorite photograph of all time, and he walks by it every day and actually speaks in French when he goes by it. <laughs> Let's see if I can. Oops, I guess I went the back wrong way. I don't know if this is working. I don't know if I did something. There we go. I guess it wasn't turned on. Now, for a lot of you, um, a photograph tells you some things, but a lot of people probably wouldn't know who three, these three people are or when it was. And and uh, I can tell you this was several decades ago. And um, Brian Dippy on the right um, is very a happy person right there. And um, and then there's Chuck. Rankin on the left, who a lot of people at the Historical Society will recall that he was um, here and was editor of Montana, the magazine of Western history. I picked Brian up from the airport that morning. He was in Portland for the Western History Association, and he was in a very foul mood. He was very upset. And uh, when we got down to the, air, uh, down to the uh, hotel, um, I asked him if I could do anything. He said, yeah, you can carry my bags up to the penthouse. <laughs> Please, ta please take the fire escape. <laughs> well, I got up there and 
And he said, well, I said, can I do anything else? And he said, yeah, you can take me out for dinner, preferably the most expensive French r restaurant in Portland. So here we are, and um, we're very happy. It's almost, the dinner's almost over with. And Brian early on asked me if I speak French, and I said no, so he, he and Chuck spoke French the whole night. <laughs> and... Uh, and, you know, Brian was, I, in between that, he was saying, I just can't find the title for this illustrated book I'm trying to write. I've been finished for two years. I can't get the title. And after listening to him speak French all night, I said, Dr. Dippy, you're a word painter. And, <laughs> and that's, and he's happy there. So when the bill came, um, Brian told me that he has a Canadian mass uh, charge card that doesn't work in the United States. <laughs> and, um, and Chuck, you can see his, uh, I don't I guess I won't use that. Chuck, Chuck uh, has, his, has writer's cramp, so he can't, so, and, and you can see with his left elbow, he's pushing the bill over to me. So. <laughs> Well, 80 years um, earlier, three other people gathered for the 1919 Calgary Stampede. And the interesting thing is, is this was a real transition period for Russell, as you've all have heard. Um, he was transitioning to his winters in California. And this is actually the last photograph I could find of him holding hands with Indians. He, he was never photographed again with Indians and probably with uh, many of his real cowboys. And this was uh, kind of his farewell. This is uh, Chief Big Belly and his wife Maggie Big Belly. Dorothea Lang, um, who was married to Maynard Dixon, as you learned yesterday, once said that photography takes an instant out of time, allowing life by holding it still. So we have a lot of life to look at in the next few minutes. This is uh, Charlie Russell, if you've seen. Um, Susan, the full sentence was, he, when he was three or four years old, he was very cute, toe-headed youngster, healthy and good-natured. That was from his sister, Susan. Ian Tyson begins the story with an old, old, in old St. Louis, a son was born to Mary Russell, and it starts the legend that every cowboy knows. St. Louis was the perfect city for Russell to grow up in. It was a city of 200,000. It was the fourth largest city in the country. And as we found, a lot of the great painters uh, had their beginnings there. Lewis and Clark left from there. But there's also another phenomenon that was um, going around the United States were these glass lantern shows where photographers were going out west painting, hand painting these glass lantern slides and then giving shows around the country. And Russell being such a visual person, I think they may have been as important as any of the nickel and dime novels that we always hear that ignited his interest in heading to Montana. The other thing you need to know in this period is, is that the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Trains, passenger trains started in 1820 in England, moved to Europe, and then exploded in the American West and changed everything. Um, the Union Pacific uh, was finished in 1869, the Southern Pacific, Northern Pacific in 1883, the Canadian Pacific and the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe in 1885, and then the Great Northern Railway that goes through northern Montana in 1893. And it's just of interest, um, you know, a lot of people think that the Northern Pacific and the Great Northern were big competitors, but by 1900, James J. Hill controlled both, and they were controlled out of the same building in St. Paul. You saw this a little bit earlier, and I would just add that I think Charlie looks very unhappy. He looks heavy. I think when he was at the military school in Burlington, New Jersey. I think he ate and, and had guard duty. His friends on the weekends got to go across the Delaware River into Philadelphia, but he um, was always a problem. And uh, the parents tried to get him not to go to Montana, but fi finally relinquished.
the the artists that went out west were also accompanied by photographers. And the first photographers who went out west were often from the Midwest, and they made their own cameras. And they went out to the little towns. They photographed the roundups, the Indians. They supplemented with portraits in town. And um, so they were waiting for Charlie when he got off the stage in Helena. Um, but no, no famous photographer was there. That would happen many years later. And photography really came alive in the United States during the Civil War. Civil War had always been glor glorified, and um, photography was fairly new. It was just really got off the ground in 1839. And folks like Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner would go out to the battle sites um, after the battles, usually. They waited until after that, and then they would photograph the battle scenes. And then Brady would have his uh, exhibits in New York, and it just stunned people. And for generations after that, people in, in any time in American history understood the power of photography. Anybody could s understand a picture. This is one person that could either dazzle you or give you nightmares. General George Armstrong Strong Custer. This was actually taken uh, 100 years ago this year. He was the youngest ge general in the Army. He fought in the first battle and the last battle. He was so well thought of that he was given the signing table at, at Appomattox after at the end of the Civil War. And what I find interesting and when you read history, as history is so much of its time and cultural, today if you read a college textbook, they don't even mention him in the Civil War. He is such an anti-hero. Um, I, I find it amazing. You, know, you read about uh, Grant or many of the other generals. Custer is like never existed during the Civil War. But he was really iconic for a lot of young boys. Um, he was so young. And uh, these photographs by Brady were just circulated all over the country. Um, Brady photographed 12 presidents. Anybody in America that was anybody had their photograph taken by Brady. The $5 bill that you have in your wallet um, is a photograph by Brady. So probably the most famous and most important photographer in American history. Now, let me go back to this. You can see the pose that Brady um, put Custer in. This is called the Custer pose. Brady probably orchestrated this. So all the photographers that are out west that really don't know what they're doing, when Charlie comes into the studio <laughs> around 1882, 1883, he has the Custer pose. Here's Custer and Libby. Libby was much like Nancy, a huge supporter of the legacy of Custer until she died in 1933. But again, this pose was copied by photographers out west. This is a, a photograph taken by uh, taken in White Sulphur Springs, and it's a tin type. Those aren't reproduced, and the image is reversed. If you look um, at the Britzman uh, biography in 1948, you'll see it reversed, and it looks like Charlie's left-handed. This is the same problem they had with Billy the Kid for years. In fact, there were movies made with Billy the Kid shooting the gun left-handed, but they were taking it from a tin type, um, and when you reverse it, it's really right-handed. Uh, that little tin type sold for $2.6 million um, a couple years ago. This is the first amateur photograph taken of Russell. One of the great inventors in the era of great inventors was George Eastman out of Rochester, New York. And originally, all the photographs were circular. And I even wonder sometimes, so some of these circular paintings that Russell did, they were looking at so many circular photographs that he sometimes kind of wanted to reproduce those. But in the late 1880, 1888 to 1890, there were Kodak number one and Kodak number two cameras. And they were $25, which was a lot of money probably the cost of an iPhone. And they were loaded with 100 images, and then when you shot them all, you, they were sent back to Rochester, developed for $10, and then sent back out uh, wherever. 1.5 million of these cameras were sold during the, the 1890s. And uh, 
a little after 1890, the Kodak number three came out, and they were rec rectangular. And um, really, in the 1890s, were the first um, amateur photographs, friends taking Nancy. Nancy was an incredibly avid photographer. In 1900, the Brownie camera came out. It was in uh, production for 80 years and cost a dollar, so you can imagine almost everybody in America was taking photographs. This is a photo taken in Great Falls in 1893. And this was the first photograph um, that was used as a promotional tool. Nancy's idea was Russell's image and his art were one and the same thing. There were very few artists that this um, happened to, and it was all orchestrated by Nancy. So this image ends up on these images um, shortly after they get married in 1896. She was an incredible marketer. She controlled all photographs that the public saw of Russell. Um, it, it was complete control. So she totally created the image that you think of of Russell, Nancy Russell did that. Here's a photo of uh, Nancy and Charlie uh, shortly after they got married. And one thing I'd like to say about Nancy, as you most know, she was born in Kentucky. Kentucky stayed in the Union but had a star on the Confederate flag. They're very much a southern thinking state, as was Missouri. And Nancy came out west with her mother and stepfather. Her mother had tuberculosis. Her first abandonment was her father who left them before she was born. Mother marries a cousin. They come out west to Helena, not to seek gold, but looking for the cure. One quarter of all Americans that came to the west were uh, looking for the cure for tuberculosis. It was thought that high altitude places like uh, Colorado Springs, Helena, around Bozeman, even lower ones with fresh air. Pasadena, interestingly, was started as a tubercular colony, and they tried to pass laws in California to stop all the people coming in for tuberculosis. They had a very poor idea of what was, tuberculosis was caused from. Um, it's caused by a bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, uh, close cousin to leprosy. And if you want to try to figure Nancy out, imagine being abandoned twice uh, when her mother dies in a small room in Helena. And this isn't, oh, mom just falls over dead. You're watching your mother cough up blood and sputum for months. And Nancy's sitting in the corner. It's a horrible death. It's like drowning. And that sense of loss, that sense of abandonment, um, totally psychologically can make you understand why she was so driven um, you know, when she got together with Charlie. Certainly, she would have been a heavily exposed to tuberculosis. Certainly, she would have had a positive skin test. And she carried um, the bacteria in some form, I believe, her entire life. And may explain some of their problems health-wise and also their, her inability, um, possibly her inability to get pregnant. Here's another iconic photograph of Russell in 1900, one of the finest photographs of him ever taken put to good use. If you were back in Helena, um, right after the turn of the century, in 1908, this would have been in a storefront in downtown Helena. And again, pairing famous photographs and Russell's image, that was her um, goal, to get the, the public to always uh, sense that. Even uh, 15 years later, there's the same photograph used on a banner um, from the Mint saloon. And as you all know, there's Sid Willis and Charlie late in life. <laughs> Sid um, owned the Mint Saloon, and um, the Mint Collection ended up Damon Carter and all the wonderful things they've done with that down there, including all the water, wonderful water uh, color analysis they're currently doing. And Bill Rance with Charlie in uh, 1915, another saloon owner, Silver Dollar. Rance was very close with Charlie. Unfortunately, he uh, committed suicide on a fire escape in Great Falls in 1930. Another image of Charlie that was put to good use by Nancy. She had him in the um, photography studios a lot. And there he is on the, the um, cigar box. 
And uh, this is how, this was my entrance into my first Russell book, the Russell Legacy book. I know some of you have that. It has 1,100 images in it. About 700 of them were from Jim Combs' collection, who I wanted to introduce, but uh, maybe afterwards. And um, Jim is, is the most popular person since Charlie Russell in Montana. <laughs> he would easily be governor. And, you know, he has friends everywhere. I've, I've gone all over Montana to all the antique stores, and everywhere he goes, he looks for his friendship discount. So, <laughs> and so when I saw this, uh, Jim had this, and I said, Jim, uh, I'd like to buy this, and, he, and uh, do I get your friendship discount? And he says, Larry, you're no friend of mine. <laughs> so, again, um, this is the Butte Intermountain newspaper, the big newspaper in the region at the time. Um, Charlie is right in the center of the article, and a couple of his uh, artworks are below, showing he's the real thing. He's the cowboy artist. He's not like all those uh, fakers back east. Again, this is all orchestrated by Nancy. Another um, national publication. This was the first publication that showed Charlie's um, log home studio that they built in 1903. Tons of photographs were taken outside the studio. He was proud of it. Nancy loved it. He was the cowboy. It looked like he lived in a little log cabin out in the wilderness. And uh, again, paired with some of his artwork. This was uh, photographed by Sumner, Sumner Matson, who was a photojournalist out of Milwaukee. Itinerant, went all around the country. Very typical of a lot of photojournalistic photographers, uh, always never made much money, always looking for a new adventure. He unfortunately went to Mexico in the future and was on top of a mountain and got elevation sickness and died on top of a mountain in Mexico. This is the first interior photograph of Russell working on his paintings. Nancy loved the public to see the brilliant, untainted artist working on paintings. There is not one image that I know of of him sitting in an exhibit hawking his art. She did not want him seen as thinking there would be any financial gain from this art that the public would uh, sense. This is a, an image called the Gunfighters. And then this is uh, Josie Wright again. Uh, she had worked in the Roberts home and, and the Russell home. And so there was this also sense that Russell might be part Indian. You know, he's in all these Indian garbs, he looks like an Indian, so was he the cowboy, the Indian? It was great because if you like cowboys, Charlie's the cowboy. If you like an Indian, Charlie's the Indian, you know? And, and so, you know, he was the real deal. This is a photograph taken in front of the log cabin studio. It's, it's colorized. Color photography didn't come out until the late 20s. And, uh, this is a postcard that was made out of uh, Spokane, but circulated widely around the country. Uh, this is a photograph by Charles Morris, who is a great Montana photographer. Um, he became the largest seller, seller of postcards um, in Montana during that period. Eklund, uh, one of the Charlie Russell photographers, worked for him for a year. So, um, at this point, we know Charlie is the real deal. He's the real cowboy. He might be Indian. I've heard that one. <laughs> Believe me, Nancy never saw this, and neither did the public. <laughs> Someone commented when I showed this, you know, he's got his hands up like he really knows what he's doing, so I don't know. But, as you all know, he, he ends up in New York, and... Uh, on one of his exhibitions. And this is in the Hotel Park View on West 42nd Street. And this is the first kind of big time photographer. This was uh, Byron Studios out of New York. And Byron was unusual in that he was very successful. He had like eight or nine studios in New York. And he photographed all the Broadway um, actors. And I think possibly um, he may have uh, Hart, William S. Hart might have gotten them together. Here is 
I don't know, we can't see Nancy in this. Oh, there's Nancy. I can't see Nancy. Um, this may be one of my favorite photographs of the two of them of all time. You know, they're young, they have hope, the future's ahead of them. Um, Charlie is sitting there making a cigarette, um, rolling one. You've got the art behind him. The mysterious Pirates of the Plains, Attack of the Wagon Train, Rainy Morning, Counting Coup is, is in these photographs, the Buffalo Hunt, Scalp Dance. And enter Nancy into the scene of these public photographs. Here's Nancy looking at a, a book by Townsend, uh, Cyrus Townsend Brady called Indian Fights and Fighters with a Will Crawford um, illustration. And uh, I think the sense is, is that, Charlie, take a break while I figure out the next picture for you to paint. You know, I'm, I'm doing the study here. I'm the brains behind the operation. And she wants the public to know and get a little recognition, which I think is fine. Well, here's a one uh, you saw earlier. You know, C.S. Lewis said people need, need to be reminded more than taught. So when you see these photographs, um, <laughs> Uh, for a second time, uh, you know, there are many other things we can talk about. Uh, this is around 1906, 1907. The cabin was built in 1906 on the southern shores, southwestern shores of Lake McDonald in Glacier Park, the crown of the continent. And if you walk up the steps and walk in, on the right is a sleeping area. They also have a loft. And to the left is the fireplace that Phil Goodwin and Charlie um, etched in the wet uh, cement. Go back further, there's a little room on the right where they slept, and then further back is the kitchen. Now Bullhead Lodge was a retreat for the Russells, and they spent most of their summers there for the rest of their life. It was the meeting place of friends, famous people, and prospective clients. When Howard Eaton had his dudes uh, come into Lake McDonald area, they would come down to Bullhead Lodge. Nancy would have them sign the Bullhead Lodge uh, guest book. And guess what? She had a lot of rich client information. So it was, Nancy was always, uh, you know, it was all business for her. One of the most anticipated and one of the most important people ever to come to Bullhead Lodge was Philip R. Goodwin who was on the left there. I'm Char he probably got there and Charlie says, let's dress up as Indians. Philip R. Goodwin is considered America's sporting and wildlife artist. He was a highly trained artist. Um, Rhode Island School of Design, he, he uh, trained with Howard Pyle. If you were an illustrator in America and you wanted a job, almost all the jobs of illustration in the United States went through Howard Pyle. Um, a lot of them went down to Brandywine. Maxville Parish was down there, N.C. Wyeth. Goodwin was ahead of N.C. Wyeth in class. And by the time Goodwin showed up here, he had illustrated 12 books. He had been on a cover of Saturday Evening Post. He had illustrated Jack London's Call of the Wild, that made Jack London the first millionaire author in American history. And he was only 25 years old. Now, when Charlie was, uh, became a full-time artist, when he was almost 30, um, just starting out. So, this is the one accomplished artist that Nancy absolutely loved, and I really don't understand, but she loved the fellow. Charlie loved him. They yearned to have him come back. Charlie pined over him for years. Um, Nancy took photographs of him. Goodwin took photographs of them. They exchanged photographs. They just really, um, it was a real love fest. And, after that, uh, Goodwin came back in 1910 and he had illustrated Teddy Roosevelt's African Game Trails by then. And Teddy Roosevelt could have picked any uh, animal life illustrator in the world and he had picked Goodwin. Goodwin, I think, in that period really helped Russell with composition and color because Russell's art just exploded in that period as uh, some of the folks were talking about yesterday. Here's another one of them out that Nancy took. And I don't know if you've ever seen those head straps, but when you had a sleeping bag in this period until the mid-century, this is how you carried them. They weren't on shoulder straps. These are called tump lines. And um, I don't really think Goodwin learned much from Charlie, but he did learn about compositions. Um, and I think that's the main reason he went out there. Goodwin would also spend time with Rungus and Banff. But here's an example. Look at this. Look at their, their shoes. 
their boots, their pants, and then look at this. And this is one of Philip R. Goodwin's paintings. Charlie's on the right, changed a little, but he's got that jutting chin. He's got a face as if engineered by, or created by an engineer. Um, and this is set um, around McDonald Creek. Now, one of the advertising bonanzas for Nancy was the uh, Pablo Buffalo hunt, and Charlie was there in 1908 and 1909. They were selling 700 head uh, and selling it for 200,000 to the Canadian government. Photojournalists came in from Canada. Norman Forsyth from Butte, the great stereograph photographer, he created a set of 66 stereographs of this. It was a real manly thing. These were distributed. This is a men's place. No women allowed. It's never been written about that Nancy was there. How could she miss this one? This is so good. Well, she didn't miss it. <laughs> this is the first evidence that Nancy um, was at the Pablo Buffalo hunt. And uh, some of the real famous scenes are one of him in the tent where he's laying down on his stomach. I mean, that's all set up. Probably took an hour for him to get that right. And I'm sure Nancy's sitting there. Uh, telling them how to take the picture. This is a kind of a fun one because this is from a private collection. Nancy would have never seen this. This is in August 1912, right after he had completed um, the big mural that you just saw. He looked pretty smug and he wanted to get that mural done because he needed to go to the Calgary Stampede in September. Here's an image of Russell. This is what the public would have seen the consummate artist working on the painting. But this is what they didn't see. And here's Russell, and he's painted himself. I guess I don't know how to do this, the laser, but he's painted himself into the um, Indian, to the left of the Indian on the horse. And in this painting, he has that hair almost identical. In the final product, he changes it a little. But I think Russell probably painted himself into a lot more paintings than we realize. And he, sometimes you go, yeah, that's Charlie Russell. But I think a lot of times, especially in the paintings, he kind of tweaked it. And then here he is. Um, and he looks a little different. And as I mentioned a couple days ago, this is the classic Russell composition. And, and it's been talked about the pyramidal composition, usually a white image up front. Your eye sees that first, then it drifts to the right, drifts to the left, and he brings the landscape in. And, um, you know, John Ford knew the importance of the landscape. That's why he had a lot of his movies made in Monument Valley. Um, it's been said that uh, the main character in a Western, and I think the main character in a lot of Russell's paintings, is the landscape. His, you know, if, if these images didn't have incredible landscapes behind them, they just wouldn't have the effect. Well, Brian Dippy wrote a wonderful publication on the 1912 Calgary Stampede for their 100th anniversary, and this was their biggest payday to date. Calgary was 50,000 people, it was booming, Great Falls was about 10,000, and the Russells went up there for a show and it was uh, put together by Guy Wiedek, and he was only 27 years old. He was a, a roper. And, you know, I, I didn't notice for a long time, but really Nancy's kind of the center of attention. Russell's kind of off to the side. And uh, Ed Bereen is in the photograph, too. In this period, there was a photographer named uh, A.J. Theory, and you just don't think of these sort of photographs of Russell. This is close to Lake McDonald, and it almost has that mystic, pictorialist feeling to it. On the far left is William Craigoff, the Philadelphia portrait painter. Um, and you can see Nancy and Charlie on the right. Austin uh, Russell's uh, in there. He lived with the Russells from 1908 to 1916. He kind of took off when Jack and, and um, Jody Young showed up. About that time, Eklund, who a lot of you are familiar with, did a lot of late life photography of Russell, entered the scene. Um, he may have entered it earlier, but that's uh, another story. Uh, this is uh, Frank Linderman in the back standing up. This was 
Russell's social conscience, his historian, he loved Frank Linderman. Linderman's father's uh, sitting down on the front right. This is a little book called The Pleasant Marianne. And they're up in Fort Benton, and they're going to go down the Missouri and kind of go where Lewis and Clark went. And they, Charlie reads from the book, and it turns out to be a disaster. The boat gets a leak in the bottom, gas gets in the bottom, and stormy, and it was very memorable. And right in that same year, this is another never-before-seen image of Russell that Eklund uh, photographed in the studio. And of course, uh, when the land belonged to God, uh, photographed by N.D. Stark um, from North Dakota Stark. It's probably the only thing North Dakota's been famous for before Bakken oil field. <laughs> Sorry, I grew up right next to North Dakota's. I got to throw in a North Dakota joke. Um, Jefferson would have been proud of this painting. Um, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, the father of the American West, his god was the god of nature. So this could have been called when the land belonged to nature. This wasn't the Christian god. Um, many of our, four, our founding fathers were not Christians in the sense of you, you, that you think of them. They were very much a product of the Enlightenment. Um, they were Unitarians. They didn't believe in the miracles in the Bible. And so Jefferson's god was nature. Out west is where God was. And, and a lot of la landscape photographers, Bierstadt, um, Thomas Moran in the Romantic period, uh, glorified this with lights that looked like you're in heaven. And I really think, um, and it's not talked about much, but I think Russell was really influenced by the Romanticists later in life. Maxfield Parrish gets a lot of press, but it, in that period, and that's because the, the Romantic painters were out. I mean, it was like, if you said you liked the Romantic painter, you, it was, you were not well thought of. Charlie did say, you know, I really, I like Moran, you know, that old guy. But um, after 1900, the Romantic painters uh, were just not in vogue. But in the 1860s, 1870s, um, they really captured... Um, and uh, sun, setting sun, the romantic period that I think Russell incorporated in his late life images. Moran and Meerstadt images were printed by the tens of thousands when Charlie was growing up, so he would have seen those. And the most important thing I can tell you from the whole conference is that this was not commissioned by the Montana Club, this was co commissioned by Kirby Lambert. <laughs> he was, he was what only, I don't know. Do the you know hundred, and uh, and Kirby commissioned this so that they could use it on the cover of their book, their fabulous book. Please buy the book. Kirby's still paying on this painting. So this is a photograph I believe Brian showed last night, a hundred years ago. Another promotional um, aspect of Nancy's plan was to follow uh, the dudes through Glacier. Uh, Howard Eaton invited them, and it was perfect. They were wealthy. The Great Northern Railway sponsored these. Uh, Mary Roberts Reinhardt was with them, and she wrote Through Glacier, where she talks about their trip. It's a great book. Uh, this is Charlie, high in the mountains, uh, working with his wax. And this ended up in Recreation Magazine in 1917. Very few of these photographs that you ever see of Russell was just, uh, oh, well, he took a picture. There was always a reason for it. Well, the Russells, until 1915, 1916, had been on the West That Has Passed tour endlessly. Nancy had, I think, run Charlie into the ground, and she'd run herself in the ground. Um, and so... World War I was on in Europe, the uh, American economy was shaky, and in time the government would take over the Great Northern Railway. Louis Hill would step down from that. He was not going to let the government people tell him what to do. And so it was probably a good time to maybe bring people into the family, and we've talked about Jody Young that uh, grew up in Bartlesville and got meningitis and was deaf in Prescott, Arizona when he was working on a movie uh, by Tom Mix. But he came in January of 1916, and he became uh, Charlie's only protege. He became babysitter for Jack, taking care of the horses, taking care of the house. 
and went on to have his own career as a movie consultant later on, movies like Shane, The Big Sky, and The Northwest Mounted Police. I put that one in there for Brian. <laughs> but Jack was just, uh, up, uh, I mean, Joe was just a great addition to that, that family, as has been discussed earlier. That same year that uh, he came to live with him in 1916, uh, Charlie and Nancy took another trip to uh, the southwest with Eden. An again, another new clientele for her to get their names and, and work during this tour, and also they got their way paid. And this is just kind of a fun image that's never been published before of Nancy and Charlie um, in one of the tents. They're in the middle one. And he Eden would have the married couples in one tent, and on both one side he'd have the single girls, on the other side the single boys. Keep them separated. This was uh, photographed by Almiron Baker that uh, also did the Glacier Park um, photographs. He was employed by Fred Kaiser, who was the official photographer of uh, Glacier Park until 1915. But by 1913, Kaiser had really done all the photographs that he did of Glacier. So he wasn't around much, and he probably turfed this um, project off to, to Baker. Baker ended up uh, having a studio in Corvallis, Oregon, and that's where he he is buried. The famous photograph, uh, you've probably seen it several times. Carl Sandburg said, a baby is God's opinion that the world should go on. This was a great addition to the Russell family. And uh, Charlie was just enthralled with Jack. They adopted him on December 3rd, 1916. Here they are in 1918, and I think Charlie would have been just happy to play around with Jack forever. This did not set well with Nancy. And when the war got over in 1919, she wanted him back to work because she loved Cadillacs, Lincolns, furs, and jewelry. And uh, she was a good promoter and knew how to make money. Um, she didn't know how to keep it. And again, that probably came to the insecurities, uh, um, kind of living for the now, because you don't know what's going to happen. For a lot of people, life is a succession of shocks, and uh, she certainly fell that way. So Charlie goes down to the Montana Stock Growers Association in April 1919, and there's Montana Royal, royalty, Teddy Blue Abbott, and Charlie. A number of these photographs were taken with various people. And it's uncertain who took this photograph. L.A. Huffman, Montana's famous photographer may have taken this, and the negative may have been purchased by a fellow named Stevenson, who's kind of a relative unknown. It's uncertain. You saw the big photograph that when you walk into the McKay collection, and that was signed by Stevenson, but it's possible that Huffman photographed that, and Stevenson bought the negative years later. L.A. Huffman once said that pictures tell a story that, as time goes on, grows more interesting, and that's certainly true. And I thought I'd just diverge a little and just show you uh, Russell's use of, of photographs in his work, especially early on. So this is uh, the template for his famous Scattering the Writers from 1900. This was the painting that was, and I'll show it to you in a minute, that was on the one that was shown earlier. Um, that is in the collection of the Montana Historical Society on the calendar. Actually, it was the cover of my Charles and Russell legacy book that Kirby and, Kirby and I got photographed. And here's, here's the image. So I'll go back. Notice the fellow on the left, and then notice the fellow holding the hand up. And it's not the exact thing. Remington did the same thing. Remington would come out west early on in his career, too, collect photographs, Huffman photographs, take two of them, put them together, and make an illustration, put it in uh, articles that uh, Teddy Roosevelt um, wrote and probably got Remington um, on the road to fame and fortune. Again, you can see that he's moved the horse in. In this composition, it's pyramidal. He's moved it in, but instead of that white horse out front, he uses the glow, the white glow of the cigarette to bring your eyes up front, and then you follow track down to the right to the white horse, and then off to the left of the bucking bronco. So when you're visualizing art, it's always fun to see where your eyes go, and it's, and it's done 
for a reason. It's not just by chance. They've actually done studies of people that look at other people and what they look at first in a person, whether their eye, hair, shoulders, and, and they, they have all these studies that point that out. Charlie's back at the Calgary Stampede in 1919, the, vic the Victory Stampede, August 1919. And again, there's Nancy in the middle and Charlie um, to the right of her. One of the great things about that stampede is um, this photograph by Harry Pollard, who was from Ontario, but he, about when he was 18, he came out to Calgary and he became the official photographer of the Can Canadian Pacific. Um, and this photograph uh, is one of the iconic photographs of Russell that's on the cover of the book. Transition time in many ways. Russell's health begins to fail, and Nancy has been very good at hiding the large tumor on his lower neck. This is the only photograph ever produced with showing the huge tumor on his lower neck. His collar is open. Nancy would have never seen this in her lifetime. She would have had this destroyed. But he's voting on Lake McDonald, and he probably got out of her sight, and he opened up his collar for the first time, because around public, it was always closed. She had collars made for him, and uh, as his tumor got bigger and bigger, he had, she had to adjust the collar length. And, um, and I think in a way this, this uh, image also reflects what Montana was going through. After World War I, Montana went through a depression. The Anaconda copper mine was being depleted. It, and through the 20s, um, Montana didn't uh, experience a good economy like the rest of the country. In fact, in my hometown in Plentywood, the, the producer news was for the Communist Party was their national paper, if you can believe that, the national paper for the Communist Party. And they elected commu communist officials. So it's another reason why Nancy probably needed to move uh, to a more lucrative perch, and that perch was Southern California. Now the 1920s was the Roaring Twenties. It was a time when Art Deco was in fad, jazz was the music. The most famous uh, athletes were Babe Ruth and, and Jack Dempsey, the fighter. And it was the time of silent movies, of electricity and homes, of radio. It was exciting. It was also a time when everybody was buying on margin. And that buying on margin in 1929 would lead to the, the stock crash. The movie industry is really interesting. Brian did a great job of talking about it. I'm going to try add a few little tidbits that maybe he, um, that, so I don't say the same thing he did. The movie industry started in New York and New Jersey, and it started there because of Thomas Edison, the inventor of all inventors. Edison completely controlled all movies made. He had agreements with Kodak. He had agreements with all the movie theaters in the United States, and he controlled all the directors and what got made into movies. He thought a movie should only be 15 minutes and there should be no movie stars. Well, there was a young director named D.W. Griffith, which is the great director in the early 20th century, and he moved out to Hollywood. One of the reasons also to move to Hollywood was because of lighting. At that time, if you were filming a film, the indoor scenes were shot outside. They were kind of like a dollhouse where you had the light in. So there were no indoor scenes shot because of the poor film technology. Los Angeles at that time was a city of 500,000. It's where America's royalty was. Oil men were there. People were flocking in from the Midwest. And it was just an exciting time to be in Los Angeles. There were 160 movie studios producing 80% of all the movies in the world. In 1915, uh, D.W. Griffith, again, who was in New York, um, films Birth of the Nation. It was the first full-length movie. Um, one of the famous people who got a bit part in that uh, was the director, John Ford. But the Russells weren't strangers in paradise. Many of his friends from Montana had, and other places had moved to Southern California. Um, this first image is from 1899. This is the cowboy poet Wallace Coburn, along with the cowboy artist. He was down in Los Angeles making movies. 
Ed Breen, great artist, was in Santa Barbara. He had accompanied Russell to the Calgary Stampedes. B.M. Bauer, uh, Chip of the Flying U, she was down there. That got made into like four movies, and she was down on the set making sure it was made right. And then, again, the great Frank Linderman. Um, the bond between them was probably Charlie's closest bond. And, and friends uh, see the same truth, and Russell and Linderman saw the same truth. They shared it. Linderman had moved to uh, Southern California. He was starting to have heart problems, and so he had moved to a different climate. One of the problems with um, th the thyroid condition that Charlie was experiencing, when you have low thyroid, um, you're, you're tired, you have cold insensitivity, not good for high cholesterol. He was smoking and, and probably getting early congestive heart failure. His production really started tailing off because he just didn't feel good. And he had this huge tumor pressing against his breathing tube. So if you want to feel how he felt, you can push your hand in on your throat. And that's what he was having to deal with every day. This is uh, another photo from 1912, July 4th in Browning. And that's Frank Tenney Johnson on the left. He be, kind of became the, cow, or the Western artist after Russell died. Um, uh, Craig Off again is next to him, the Philadelphia portrait painter. And Joe Shirley from Chicago, who did the Great Northern Mountain Goat. Percy Ravens uh, sitting down there. Uh, Ravens became some of the Russell's closest friends. And much has been said already about William S. Hart. This is from 1920. And um, it's interesting because the Ben-Hur uh, information you showed earlier, um, William S. Hart was in that play. And in, and in 1902... Hart was traveling around the country in a play called The Christian that Byron mentioned, and that's where Charlie and um, Hart first met. Hart loved Western history. He had Billy the Kid's six-shooter. He was a friends of Wyatt Earp, friends of Bat Masterson. Both of them had located to southern Oregon. And he, he was an authentic Western character, and he was the largest box office draw in 1915 and 1916 in America. But things change, and the public did not like the realistic cowboy movies. And so his uh, stardom started fading. Like so many of Russell's friends, Will Rogers was the only person that made that transition to talk, talking movies that occurred in the late 20s. Um, stars like Tom Mix, Hoot Gibson, Neil Hart, they were exciting. Um, they were... Um, much more non-authentic, and while Russell liked them, I, I think he, his heart was with, with heart. This was shown earlier, and um, so I'm not going to say a lot about this, other than Charles Loomis was the Frank Linderman of the Southwest. He had gone to Harvard. He was friends with Teddy Roosevelt. He walked from Ohio to S Southern California, became the first city editor of the Los Angeles Times in 1884. But he was a womanizer and heavy drinker. By 1920, he'd almost lost everything. But must have been an incredibly charismatic person. Ed Berean and, and Maynard Dixon both got married in his home. He liked to party. And look at Charlie's collar. Look how high that is. It's just um, an amazing uh, image there. And again, Harold Lloyd's on the right. And uh, he ranked with Chap Chaplin and Buster Keaton as the top comedians. He made his full length, first full-length uh, comedy in 1921. So now the image is Russells are in California in the winter. They're basically at Bullhead Lodge in the summer. They're not spending much time in Great Falls, but Russell is back-trailing on the old frontier. And he spends a, some of his time going up to Fort Benton, uh, reminiscing, he's going east of Great Falls. This is back down to Jake Hoover's cabin. It's about 70 miles southeast of Great Falls. Jake Hoover is now a fishing guide in Puget Sound, and is, he's buried there, um, which is kind of interesting. But Russell is just absorbing all the memories of when he was with Jake Hoover. And this is one of the products of those memories, salute to the robe trade that William Armstrong bought for $10,000. And um, it's really important on these numbers, $10,000 doesn't sound much like that, but you can uh, 
take it by 20 to 25, and that's about what the inflation rate is as far as what it would be worth today. So they made a lot of money in their time, and it's, but they spent a lot of money. Douglas Fairbanks, he was an actor, screenwriter, director, producer. He was in Three Musketeers, which this scene is from, Robin Hood, Zorro. He took over uh, from Hart as the big box box office hit in 1918. And he married Mary Pickford, America's darling. She was the most popular woman in 19, through the 1910s and 1920s uh, in the world. And she, while she was called the American sweetheart, she was actually born in Toronto. And her father abandoned her much like Nancy's father had. Again, both of these uh, folks did not do well in the late 20s. Uh, their wealth declined as uh, they transitioned to the talking movies. He was the, Douglas Fairbanks was the first president of the Motion Picture Academy, and he also hosted the first Academy Awards in 1929. Nancy, of course, wouldn't want to be left out. <laughs> Will Rogers, the most famous man in the world, part Cherokee from Oklahoma Territory, now Oklahoma, Charlie was attracted to these folks that had Indian heritage, like Jack Dempsey, too, that was also Cherokee. He, they probably saw each other when um, Will Rogers was a trick roper in the 1904 World's Fair. He was a vaudevillian, incredible roper. Um, they saw each other in Ed Barine's studio in New York. And from 1922 to 1935, when he died in a uh, airplane crash in Alaska with Wiley Post. 40 million people a week read his column in the New York Times. He was a social humorist. And I'm sure many of you, you don't hear it much anymore, but when I was growing up, there were just the Will Rogers sayings all the time. And these two are reunited in Statutory Hall in the Capitol building. Um, Charlie represents Montana. He's the only artist to represent a state. And of course, Rogers represents Oklahoma. Another fun fact on this photograph, that it was photographed by Clarence Sinclair Bull, who was actually from Sun River, Montana, which is right next to Great Falls, and they, he may have met Charlie when he was a young man. He went to work for Goldwyn Studios and became probably the most famous still photographer in American history. He won four Academy Awards. He was known for over 2,000 photographs of Greta Garbo, but he also photographed um, our beloved Gary Cooper. among others. In 1921, uh, the Russells are having uh, a show at the Brown Palace in Denver, and uh, Nancy arranges to have Roland Reed, the great photographer, pictorialist of the American West. The photographers are now starting to get more famous. He was from Wisconsin, uh, had studios in Kalispell, San Diego, Colorado, and they sat for these wonderful images. Here's Nancy uh, with her furs and quite a transition from her days in Helena. And one of the photo was used on one of these advertisements that Percy Rabin put in the Montana News Association in 1922. The Mon Montana economy was doing so bad that he was selling these for just a dollar. But things were not a problem in Southern California. This is a, an image that you saw earlier and um, there's Charlie Russell on the bottom row. Next to him is um, Harry Carey. Uh, Doby, or Harry Carey Jr., is a little boy. He'll, he'll be a star in Stagecoach in The Searchers, so if you watch The Searchers, uh, look for him. And then the little kids behind them, those are Will Rogers' kid, and the tallest little boy is Will Rogers Jr., and he'll end up being a pallbearer in Nancy Russell's funeral. Carey... Um, Early on, starred in a play that went around the country. He wrote it, and he made a quarter of a million dollars on it by the time he was 19. By the time he was 30, he had grown up in New York, and uh, he believed in realism in his movies, which Russell um, really appreciated. This is another uh, photograph. The second, the lady to the right is Olive Carey. She's also in the Searchers. This is on the. Carey Ranch, which is, was a 3,700-acre ranch um, 
40 miles northwest of uh, Los Angeles. And uh, it was an incredible ranch, but they also started having suffering financially in the late 20s. They actually had to start boarding people to make money and they had to go back out on the road. Um, so their fortunes definitely plummeted. But for now, life was good, and here's Russell and Harry Carey roping in front of their home. Another photo of Russell in front of, or at, on the grounds. And then this is one of my uh, dazzling moments. Um, Steve Eckert found this in the effects of Will James, Nancy and Charlie, I'm sure never saw this. But there's John Ford with Russell. You saw, uh, saw it last night. Um, and. It really puts together the Harry Carey Ford Russell connection, as Byron talked about. Um, the thing you need to know about John Ford is, is that he got his start by Harry Carey. His first directing job, Olive Carey had suggested they use this young director. He's only like 22 when he directed his first movie. He actually lived with the Careys for a while. And he would tell John Wayne later to walk like Harry Carey and talk like Harry Carey. Um, John Ford went on to win four Academy Awards, perhaps the best and greatest director of all times. He uh, made 136 movies, 54 of them were westerns, and nine of them were in Monument Valley. And uh, again, in Monument Valley, the main character is the landscape. Now, in all the biographies, um, it was never known that Charlie met President Warren Harding and when he was in Butte in June of 1923. Harding was on the voyage of understanding on an 18-city tour. Um, it was, he was working on his re-election, and he took with him uh, Fairbanks and Pickford and Edison and Ford and Harvey Firestone. And perhaps that's why Russell came down to Butte, because Russell said, I've got no business here. I'm a black-hearted Democrat. And, and uh, Harding was presented with where the best of writers quit. But within two or three months, Harding would uh, die of a heart attack in San Francisco. He was Amazingly, he was the first sitting president to go to Canada. And he was the first president to visit Alaska. Here's the great Jack Dempsey. Back in that time, um, he was a heavyweight champion from 1919 to 1926, and they were going to have a world championship in Shelby, of all places. And um, what they would do in that period is these guys, they'd get these big purses put up in really small communities, and then they'd have some patsy come in. Tommy Gibbons came in from St. Paul. Uh, Louis Hill had trains planned to come out, and they were going to have 20,000, 30,000 people in Shelby. Shelby was uh, one area that was kind of booming, and so that's why they hosted this. And Charlie was fascinated with the Manassa Mauler. He was from Manassas, um, Colorado, again at Cherokee. And after this fight, it, it ended up being a disaster. People didn't pay. A lot of the businesses in Shelby uh, lost money. Uh, Charlie got on a train to Bullhead Lodge, and that's when he fell and hurt his back and just augmented his uh, declining health. This one of these images have been shown, but he's really getting into the realm of famous photographers now. There's probably no bigger photographer than Dorothea Lange in the 19 or the 20th century. Her Depression era depictions of uh, the homeless from in the Depression are just stunning uh, reminders of that horrible time in American history. But the Russells were in San Francisco. Of course, Nancy did not like Maynard Dixon. So she didn't probably go up to the studio. She was probably down on Union Square going to Gump's shopping. But Charlie goes up, and Dorothea Lane takes these iconic images of Russell while he and uh, Maynard Dixon are talking. Whether they were staged or not, I'm not sure. She said they weren't. And look at the length of his thumb. It's, it's just amazing. His thumb's as long as a finger. No wonder he could. that helped him do his sculpting. I'll have to come around here. So it had the quality not unlike other rare occasions when 
I have been in the presence of the old type American Indians, there is something, there's sort of a echo which remains in this, to this day. And this was done in 1961, um, uh, kind of, uh, again, a combination of where photographs and words work together. Here is another iconic photo of Russell with William Hart and Will James. Will James was the artist. He was also a writer, um, and his first famous book was Smokey the Cow Horse, the Newbery Award winner for children's books in 1926. And Nancy wanted to have Charlie do books like um, Will James, and she also wanted to have Charlie paid as well as Will James. She did not like Will James either. This is from March 1924. We're going up now the ladder of famous photographers, Edward S. Curtis. Uh, after the images were taken in San Francisco, the R Russells head to LA, and Curtis has a gallery in the Biltmore in Los Angeles. He'd moved down from Seattle, where he'd gone through a messy divorce, working on his 20-volume set of North American Indians, which I think of any actor, or any artist or photographer is the most incredible uh, labor of love of anybody, um, in, including Russell. It's just incredible. But Russell sat for Curtis, and this is kind of a fun image because it's signed uh, by Curtis and Russell. Curtis also did these gold tones, or these, they were called Kirk tones. These were actually images not on paper, but were on glass, and they used kind of an, a banana emulsion. Curtis normally did not do these of white people. Those were reserved for the famous Indians, like Chief Joseph that he photographed. But for Russell, he created this image, which is in the Russell Museum. Not to let the public think that Charlie would have abandoned his family life, Nancy has this photo taken at Bullhead Lodge in 1924. She will use it in 1930 on a home magazine article. Jack has been being kind of thrown around from being babysitting in Great Falls to being put in um, schools where he, had, where he was separated from Nancy and Charlie. They were on still traveling a lot, and Nancy just uh, could not deal with Jack at that point. And their idea of parenting was spoiling him with gifts when they were there, but they were gone a lot. And this is kind of apocalypse now. This is February 1925. His goiter is getting worse. He has a cold. He's at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C. And this is his last exhibit that he would ever be at. And this is one from Steve Eckert, too. And he, I think he found it in a book back on the East Coast. So Charlie and Nancy would have never seen this. She would have never wanted anybody to see this image. Um, he just looks ghastly. She looks more like his daughter or granddaughter. But now she's pushing the bronzes. This is where the best of writers quit. This is the bronze that Harding got. This was in the March 1925 Seattle Times. Very important point. Half of Russell bronzes that were cast in his lifetime were done after 1920. One of the reasons was is Nancy knew that Charlie was not going to live long, and this was her insurance policy. She had a maiden... Um, nine to ten uh, groupings of, of one bronze. So she had tons of bronzes so that when Charlie died, um, she could sell those and have an income. So he got to work doing a lot of bronzes in that per period. And bronze uh, modeling was almost his default mode. I think he was probably best at that. Now with the sense that Russell wasn't going to be around, a lot of different people started inviting him to uh, remembrance set, uh, shows and uh, rodeos and roundups, and this is one that he did accept. This is July 21st, 1925 at the John Stevens Memorial at Marias Pass in Glacier. John Stevens was the first uh, white man to find the pass. He was an engineer for the Great Northern Railway, and by 1925 he had worked out another little project called the Panama Canal. Um, this is, they uh, started in um, Fort Union on eastern Montana on the Upper Missouri Historical Expedition, sponsored by the Great Northern Railway, and then went to um, Lake McDonald and had a banquet at Lake McDonald Lodge. Irving S. Cobb in the middle was the 
very famous humorist, and he was the MC of the, the evening. John Lewis is on the left. He built um, Lake McDonald Lodge in uh, 1914. That's the only lodge in Glacier that or Glacier Park that the Great Northern Railway uh, did not build. This is March, April 1926. Charlie has about six months to live, and this is considered his masterpiece in bronze, The Spirit of Winter. Um, the two of them looking at each other is uh, quite stunning and memorable. Some people believe that this is his greatest piece of artwork, including his oils and watercolors. Uh, obviously arguable. But this puts a big cloud on, on the future for Charlie. But as you saw earlier, that didn't slow Nancy down. She still drug him to these parties. And, and he, to me, the look on his face I didn't see since he was at that military academy before he came to Montana. <laughs> With a couple months to live, uh, Russell has to have that goiter taken care of. It's compressing his uh, air passages and he can't breathe. And so he goes to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, which is still one of the premier medical clinics in the country. The Mayo Clinic was started during the Civil War. One of the Mayo boys who were, was there doing health physicals for the soldiers that went into the Civil War. Decided to stay there in Rochester, brought his brother in, built the Kaler Hotel, and the rest is history. They were doing 2,000 of these goiter surgeries um, uh, every year. And uh, the iodine uh, in the diets in Montana was so low that some people were susceptible to these, these uh, enlarging thyroid glands. Now the problem that comes about when you remove thyroid tissue but you don't replace it with thyroid hormone, which wasn't available then, is you even make the condition worse. So they cut around the lower area of the thyroid, try to cut some of it out below to give him some relief, but really um, it's a very, really incomplete and primitive surgery at that time. And um, the problem is, is that iodine didn't get into iodized salt until 1925. A Cleveland physician figured that one, one out and the, the goiters in, in the world went away, but it was too late for Charlie. So you could predict with thyroid even lower than before, um, you know, two to three months and some of a, a calamity is going to happen. It certainly did. So Nancy, in her haste, started having a photographic love fest, and this is their last summer at Bullhead Lodge. Um, look at, next to Charlie is little Skookum. He's grown up. Um, Rick Stewart's uh, nickname is Skookum, by the way, and he likes to be called that. <laughs> gets very angry when, if you call him Rick, he just has a twitch. So he goes in the Eklund Studios in Great Falls and has these wonderful... Uh, Photographs taken of him. This is a very famous one. This is a trick photo of Charlie playing checkers against Charlie. Probably trying to keep a little mirth in this uh, not good situation. But on October 24th, 1926, Charlie does have the predicted heart attack. And the papers let the world know that Charlie has died with earlier photographs of him. <coughs> This is his grave in uh, Great Falls, and that's young boy, one of his models. This is an excellent photograph. Now, amazingly, you think Nancy would be mourning the loss of her beloved husband, but within three months, she's back in Pasadena having a show. Um, this is Trails End that wasn't complete when Charlie died, but um, this is where she lived the rest of her life. And this is a, a photograph of uh, Jody Young, and um, there's Jack, Nancy. There's one of the rare photos in the back of Nancy's father that abandoned her um, before she was born. This is a uh, bronze that, uh, statue that's, I think the Historical Society has one, uh, John Weaver did in 1958, and the other one is in Statutory Hall in the Capitol Building. Well, Charlie Russell had quite a ride. Uh, he, little did he know in 1893, when this photograph was taken, that he would become a legend. 
Montana's youth was ageless in Charlie's mind. It forever provided him with hope and happiness. It was the place where he had the best times of his life and old friends had character and permanence. In the end, it was Montana that had the lights, forms, and colors that Russell responded to in his art. We are blessed to have so many photographs of the word painter that paint such a vivid and lasting picture of the greatest of all Western artists. Through photography, Russell was famous before he was great, monumental while still drawing breath, apothesized while still very much alive. Indeed, God had saved his greatest gift for Charlie. Thank you.